All right, I am showing 9 o'clock, so let's uh, go ahead and get started. My name is Mike D. Lecluse. I'm president of Lessman Instrument Company. I'd like to thank all of you for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us for today's webinar, Choosing the Right Radar Antenna for Level Applications. With all the rapid changes in radar level technology, how do you know which model and antenna configuration is going to be best for your application? Well, today Mark Klee is going to share with you his knowledge and expertise to help you choose the right antenna. Our, our presenter today is Mark Klee. Mark is a senior application engineer of level and weighing products in the western United States for Siemens industry. He has more than 20 years of industrial experience in the oil and gas, water and wastewater, food and beverage, chemical and pulp and paper industries. Prior to joining Siemens, Mark was responsible for distributed control systems at Honeywell Process Solutions. From 1994 to 2006, he was branch manager for North Coast Electric, a Rockwell automation and electrical distributor in the Pacific Northwest. Mark holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Electronic Engineering Technology and a degree in Mathematics from Central Washington University. Because of the large number of attendees, uh, the phone lines will be muted. If you have a question, please type it into the chat tool. If the question is pertinent to the slide Mark is covering, I'll try to get him to answer it immediately. Otherwise, I'll save it until the end of the presentation. Start thinking about your level questions now. It's uh, very important. Uh, the questions are a very important and meaningful part of the session. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Mark. Well, good morning. I'm still unmuted, I assume. Is that right, Mike? Yeah, you're you're all set. Okay, all set. Well, hey, greetings from the uh, sunny Pacific Northwest this morning. Uh, I find myself in a uh, little town of Medford, Oregon, and uh, looks to uh, gear up to be a beautiful day here. So, um, anyway, a little bit more about me in a minute. But uh, for those of you that uh, know me, you know that I always uh, like to start uh, all of my meetings with a quick safety minute. So uh, you don't have anything on the screen right now, I'll call it up in a second, but I was out recently with one of our channel partners and uh, we were working on an ultrasonic system with a uh, local municipality and uh, well, the guys didn't exactly have the right tools for the job as they were trying to adjust the sensors and so, uh, you know, kind of a, kind of a goofy, uh, goofy example here, but uh, you know, really the theme of this is having the right tools for the job to uh, get the job completed. I presented this here a couple weeks back showing this picture and somebody raised their hand and they said, yeah, shouldn't they have had two traffic cones out there? Yeah, right. Okay. Anyway, so, you know, really kind of the key takeaway is, you know, we work in a lot of dangerous environments and taking the time to uh, have the right tools and to have the right, uh, uh, the right uh, safety equipment in place to uh, get the job done safely is kind of the uh, takeaway today. So. Uh, as Mike introduced me um, as the level and weighing uh, application engineer for Siemens, that is true. Uh, however, uh, basically everything on this slide is an area of responsibility that I have with Siemens. So we'll be talking today kind of in that, uh, here in this one o'clock position uh, today of, uh, you know, radar and the technologies there. Um, certainly I do all things up here in the 12 o'clock position which is going to be uh, all of our flow technologies. So that would be magnetic flow meters, clamp-on meters, Coriolis meters, uh, pressure, temperature, valve positioners, and then jumping straight across to the 2 to 3 o'clock position. Um, I also do a lot with our uh, weighing and uh, what we call our mass dynamics products. So uh, my role within Siemens is a technical role, not a commercial role. So what I do is I support our sales channel partners, uh, such as Lesson Instruments, on uh, you know on their technical or engineering uh, questions, but I'm also a resource for you, uh, all of the end users that are on the call today. So at the end, I'll uh, be sure to provide my contact information, and you're welcome you're welcome to reach out to me anytime. And uh, as I uh, you know, basically my whole job is, uh, hey, I'm thinking about, or how can I, or what do you have that, or what. Um, you know, what's new in the industry or, you know, our process does this, we'd like it to do that. That's really where I spend my life is doing that and training sessions such as this. Uh, where are we going to go today? Um, as uh, we were having a discussion here a few months back about, you know, all the changes in radar and all of the different antennas, 
Um, nobody's really ever put together something that says, here are all of the different radar antenna types, and here's where you might choose to use one over another. So um, we're going to talk about kind of some general stuff first, uh, uh, set some ground, you know, kind of set a foundation, if you will, uh, talk about where you might want to use radar and maybe some applications where you wouldn't. Um, we'll talk about some commonalities amongst all the radar units. Uh, it is an electromagnetic wave, and so it has some common properties regardless of the antenna type. And we'll kind of set that just to uh, kind of some general learning. Um, generally speaking, radar falls into three, uh, three major frequency bands. I call them low, medium, and high, and they, there are specific applications for those. Uh, and then we'll dive off into... Uh, looking at uh, seven different antenna types and kind of where you might use some and you know what are the pluses and minuses. Uh, where does it work really, really well and where might there be a better solution. Uh, along the way, uh, we'll talk about some different uh, extreme or unusual applications where radar has been used. And at the end, we'll just kind of, um, I've kind of put together a roadmap of six important questions you always want to ask when you're doing a, a radar application. Uh, normally, if I'm presenting live, I like to keep things uh, uh, I like to keep things very open in the room and kind of field questions along the way. Unfortunately, uh, in a webinar setting such as this, that's very difficult to do just because uh, you can't make eye contact and you wind up with people all trying to talk at the same time. So, um, you know, I'd ask uh, you know scribble your questions down, write them down. Uh, we scheduled 15 minutes at the end for questions. Um, if you have additional questions, not a problem. We will uh, uh, we'll stay on the line as long as we need to to get them uh, to get them answered. So uh, that being said, let's uh, dive right into it. Um, when is it best to use radar? Well, typically typically speaking, um, there's a number of uh, applications here. If you have relatively high temperatures, uh, certainly as you get above the boiling point of water, uh, radar is a great solution. Anytime that you have uh, unusual vapor, something other than air in the vapor space, uh, especially if you have a situation where you have a stratification of vapor layers, where just because of the densities of the, uh, of the different gases, you might have uh, uh, several different layers or two layers in there, there would be a great example for radar. Uh, radar performs very, very well in dusty applications, and you'll see that uh, show up a couple times uh, throughout the presentation today. Uh, the one I'm going to spend a moment of time on is light density foam. Um, one of the misinformation things that I'm seeing out there from a lot of uh, uh, a lot of competitors is they really are kind of overselling the uh, uh, the performance of radar in foam. It is true that radar does work better than anything else in some foam applications, uh, but there's other foam applications where radar really doesn't work very well. So generally speaking, I would say if you have a, a sales guy come in and he says, hey, we've got this new radar unit and it's the Whizbang 3000 and uh, this, is your, you know, this is your solution for foam, uh, I would say as a general rule, that's a salesman lying to you. Um, there is no magic bullet for foam. Um, and usually with foam, I spend a lot of time looking at that on a case-by-case -case basis. And it has to do with uh, the density of the foam and the dielectric constant of the foam. We'll talk about a lot of that along the way. But uh, you know, just recognize it is true. Radar works better in uh, some foam applications, but it is not a magic bullet. So um, anytime you have uh, either extremely low pressure or extremely high pressure, uh, that's a great place uh, uh, where uh, radar works well. Uh, I always tell the story of if you remember the uh, movie back from the uh, early or late 70s, early 80s, the movie Alien. Uh, they had the uh, tagline for that movie: "In space, nobody can hear you scream." If you're using an acoustical or an ultrasonic type sensor, uh, it has it's a compression wave that needs some media in order to compress. So, in a complete vacuum, nobody can hear an ultrasonic scream. And uh, but radar the electromagnetic radiation really could care less. It'll pass through a vacuum uh, very, very efficiently. So with that, we'll kind of jump on to a couple uh, things here on the base of technologies uh, for radar. Really, there's two. There's a pulsed radar and an FMCW, or frequency modulated continuous wave. Boy, say that's three times fast. Uh, 
with a little bit of coffee this morning. Um, really the key takeaway on this, whether it's a pulse and it's measuring time of flight or a FMCW where it's me measuring a phase shift, there really isn't an appreciable advantage to one over the other uh, as far as the accuracy or the performance of the system. Uh, sometimes the pulse radar works a little bit better in low power applications or low, uh, like loop powered applications and the FMCW is typically where you have a, a line voltage, a, a 120 or a 240 volt powering the radar unit. It's kind of a general rule, but really from a performance standpoint, uh, there isn't an advantage to one over the other. One of the things that all of the Siemens radars have uh, is uh, what's shown on this slide. And probably the big one is uh, right down here in our lower right-hand corner, this dynamic threshold. Okay. Uh, each and every time our radar unit goes out and makes a measurement, the TVT, or this red line, the time-bearing threshold line, is adjusted to the performance of, uh, or to the uh, process of what's happening in the process. So if you have some foam or some turbulence or uh, condensation, um, things that are uh, impacting the return signal uh, on a, uh, you know, on a uh, measurement to measurement basis, by having an adjustable TVT curve or a TVT line here, what you find is that it is always trying to optimize to your uh, signal that's coming back from your process. This is one of the things that makes Siemens uh, different from many of our competitors insofar as uh, some of our competitors have a fixed signal reference line. And as a result of that, uh, they, uh, when the performance or the conditions of the vessel that you're measuring change, uh, they may have a, a difficult time picking up on that. Uh, auto false echo suppression is shown over here on the left, and that would be where here we have an obstruction from a pipe, and we have mapped around uh, that obstruction. So in this uh, echo profile signal, anything that is to the right of the echo profile is considered a valid echo. So if we didn't map around the pipe, we would have a reflection from that and a reflection down here from our process. And now the radar unit has two different echoes to choose from. By mapping around a fixed object, uh, we do have the uh, ability to mask out uh, pipes and rails and cross members and ladder rungs and things inside of tanks and vessels. And uh, with Siemens, we do have an, an unlimited number of objects that we can map out. Uh, some, com uh, some competitive radars out there might limit you to two or three uh, because basically what they're doing is blanking out the distance of where that object is. What we do is our process is dynamic. It learns not just what the object is or where the object is, but it also learns what the object is and kind of the echo signature and also the echo signature of your uh, process vessel itself, or excuse me, your process material itself. All right, a couple other quick topics. Uh, beam angle. Uh, beam angle is often mis misrepresented. It's uh, really defined as twice the angle at which the off-axis measurement is 3 dB less than or the half power of the central transmission axis. In English, what that means is that if right here in the middle of your beam, you have your brightest spot, your 100%, Somewhere out here, you're going to have a 50% energy, and way out here on the edge is the zero uh, point. With, uh, with most of the manufacturers out there, the beam angle is twice that angle, so from the 50% all the way over to the other 50%, and that is the beam angle uh, that's uh, published. One of the things to note is that 50% of the energy is still outside of the beam angle. So it doesn't mean if your radar or uh, you know your transmitter has a 10 degree beam angle, it doesn't mean that something that's 11 or 12 degrees outside the beam angle, it's not going to see it. Uh, so what I generally use is I use something that's called the 10 to 1 rule. So what I what I'm looking at in an application, generally speaking, is that if there's a uh, for every 10 feet that you go down in distance from the emitter of the radar, uh, you want to have about a one foot radius of a circle. So if I'm looking down a narrow wet well and it's about 30 feet down, I'm looking for about a three foot radius or about a six foot area without a lot of material or a lot of uh, without a lot of obstructions in them. Uh, likewise, if I'm putting a radar unit near the edge of a tank, for every 10 feet uh, of height of the tank, I want to be at least a foot off of the sidewall. 
Um, with auto false echo suppression, that is a little bit less of an issue than uh, it has been in years past, but that 10 to 1 rule works pretty well. One thing with radar to consider is the beam is not exactly circular. I mean, in, in this picture here, I was showing it as a, as a circular uh, beam, but it's really more oblong shaped. It's kind of shaped uh, kind of like a rugby, uh, a rugby ball. Um, and so there is a polarization axis in, in all of the radars. Uh, rather than try and remember, uh, uh, you know, where that polarization axis is or all that, good rule of thumb is point the display or point the conduit entries to the nearest wall of the tank and you're going to get the best uh, performance. All right, all antennas or all electromagnetic uh, radio antennas have side lobes, including your cell phone, including radar units. And it's really uh, a function of aperture distribution. If you want to get really deep into the weeds, uh, we can start doing a Fourier transform and, and calculate side lobes and, and all of that. But really the key takeaway of this is two things. Number one is larger horn antennas typically have narrower beam angles, which to me seems backwards. It seems like a bigger, a bigger horn should have a bigger beam angle. It's exactly the opposite of what you, uh, what you would expect there. Uh, but they also have narrower side lobes, and the narrower the, the, uh, the center lobe, is the more side lobes you're going to have. Okay, um, I've represented these side lobes in two dimensions. They're actually a three-dimensional, uh, uh, three-dimensional uh, uh, object, if you will. And the second takeaway from the slide is this: it, when you have narrow applications, narrow wet wells, uh, nozzles, that type of thing, you want to um, you want to be aware of the fact that you can get false echoes caused by reflections from the energy that's in the side lobes. So let's say you have a pretty narrow beam angle, let's say 10 degrees, and you have an object that's three feet away, you figure it's way outside of the uh, beam angle, you shouldn't see it, and then all of a sudden you're picking up that object. Typically that energy is coming from a side lobe of the energy distribution of the antenna, and uh, you can take steps to mitigate that. Typically you use uh, something like your near range, or uh, some people call that a blinking distance or you could use auto false echo suppression to deal with that. So with that, uh, radar really falls into three major frequency groups. Uh, low frequency, six gigahertz, really works well in liquid applications and some light uh, density foam applications work really good with six gigahertz. Uh, the middle range, 24, 25, 26 gigahertz, really work well with most liquids and some solids. Uh, a good example of that would be some uh, like flower applications. As uh, you convey flower via air, it really fluidizes and it acts more like a liquid sometimes than a than a, uh, a, a excuse me a solid powder like a flower. So and then stepping up to the highest frequency, the 78 gigahertz range, really that's going to be the the range that you're going to be optimized for uh, dry bulk solids. Um, and that's going to be things such as uh, rocks, grain, uh, most of your powders, lime, cement, uh, coal, uh, powdered sugar, those type of things. So uh, generally speaking, and you'll see why here in a little bit, uh, the higher frequencies work better for that. So jumping really into uh, some antenna types, I have four different antenna, uh, four of our seven actually shown here, and we'll talk about each one individually. But um, the uh, LR250 family, if you notice on this, all of, the, uh, uh, all of the electronics packages on this is exactly the same uh, head or the same brains, if you will. Uh, the only thing that's different is the type of antenna that goes with the LR250. And uh, the LR250 has been uh, around for a while. It was introduced back in uh, 2007. Uh, has had a number of revisions to it over the years. Uh, it is a uh, a current and evolving product. And back uh, when the uh, when the uh, 250 and also the 260, uh, which really has an identical uh, look to it, when they were first introduced, really the main uh, horn we had on it was just the open horn assembly. There is an emitter up inside, uh, right at the base of the horn itself, uh, and you can look down the uh, uh, you know, look down the nozzle and you can see that, or look down the horn and you can see the emitter. 
It's a little uh, 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 conical uh, piece uh, at 25 gigahertz. That uh, emitter is about the end of a, a typical ballpoint pen. It's just a little conical uh, white uh, piece down at the base of the emitter. Um, really with the uh, open hornet assembly, it's going to work well for uh, a lot of uh, uh, liquids applications. One place that the 250 and also the 260 work really, really well in is uh, crude oil tanks. Uh, as you look through the, uh, you know, the Balkans, I, I realize that uh, you know the price of oil is down, and so a lot of production is uh, has shut down. But there are literally thousands of these things installed in uh, oil production tanks all over the Dakotas and and uh, Colorado and Wyoming. And there are, there are thousands of these with the open horn assemblies working on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, work pretty well with uh, low dielectric constant materials. We'll talk about DK here in just a little bit. Um, the LR260 is really the same design uh, with the open horn assembly, but it's optimized for solids. One of the things in solid applications is there is a dust shield or a dust guard which can fit over the end of the horn to keep... Um, uh, to keep liquids, or excuse me, to keep the powders from getting up and caking the inside of the antenna. Uh, one of the challenges with this open horn is if you have a lot of condensation in your environment, uh, condensation that gets up on that emitter uh, can cause unpredictable results and uh, erratic readings. So uh, generally, if you have a lot of condensation or uh, 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 something, uh, you know, we did a, a radar unit recently where it was uh, molten sulfur. Uh, this is not a great application for that, uh, for that because if you get caking or condensation on the emitter, uh, it may not perform as well. So one solution to that is going to uh, the PVDF antenna, which is our second antenna type this morning. The PVDF antenna is really nothing more than uh, this inch and a half or two inch uh, horn shown down here on the right, uh, basically encased in a PVDF material. Uh, makes the uh, uh, makes the uh, antenna very chemically inert uh, to um, most uh, uh, most corrosive chemicals. Uh, one of the things that uh, this does not perform well at is in your fluorine-based uh, uh, products. So uh, fluoritic acid, which is probably one of the nastiest acids I've ever dealt with, uh, would be uh, would be something that would actually attack this type of material. Okay. Um, so now we jump into something that's relatively new, which is what we call our flanged encapsulated or FEA type antenna. Um, what the FEA antenna is, is again, this is, uh, was designed originally for the chemical and the petrochemical industry. It is a regular ANSI 150-pound uh, flange. As you will see here, let me jump to this other picture. But uh, the horn assembly itself is actually um, uh, completely enclosed with this uh, uh, with this uh, non-metallic material, uh, the TFM 1600 material, and uh, it is also chemically inert to most uh, most acids. Again, the fluorine-based acids would be an exception to that, but um, this uh, the horn assembly has a you know is completely sealed. And then on the uh, uh, on the flange itself, what you find is that there is this ring around the uh, the dome in the center of this, which actually becomes your gasket uh, for sealing that particular flange. Now, one of the things that's significant of this, if uh, because this was designed uh, for a class one div one environment, uh, especially if you're an oil re oil refinery or something like that. If you uh, have to break the seal on this flange to do servicing, you really should replace uh, this, uh, this lens down at the bottom. It basically just screws uh, right off. It's a replacement piece uh, before you reseal the uh, environment. Uh, basically, this acts kind of like the head gasket on your car. It's going to conform to the, the slight imperfections of your uh, flange. And so, uh, if you are in a class one div one environment, a good solid engineering practice is just to replace that lens. It's a relatively inexpensive uh, uh, replacement part uh, each and every time you, you break the seal. 
if you're not class one div one, um, then uh, you know generally speaking, this thing can be reused many, many, many times over. But for that added degree of protection, uh, it is a replaceable part. Uh, fairly high temperature rating on this, um, certainly significantly higher than the PVDF antenna that we were just talking about, uh, up in the 338, 330 range, um, relatively high pressures with this. And uh, if we really got into the engineering uh, diagrams on this, you would see the number of seals and O-rings that we have sealing this up. This is really, uh, uh, really well protected to keep the environment uh, certainly uh, in the tank, but to keep it from getting up into the electronics as well. One of the things um, that is significant uh, with this is this unit, as well as the uh, next one that we talk about, performs really, really well with low dielectric constant materials. So that really kind of leads me into let's talk about dielectric constant for a moment, uh, for what that really means. Uh, dielectric constant, or DK, is a unitless engineering number. And what it does is it, it refers to the reflectivity of the, uh, uh, of the material being measured. So let me uh, kind of uh, uh, do a little thought experiment here. So imagine I'm sitting here in the room and I'm holding a radar unit in my hand and I'm pointing at the wall here uh, 20 feet away. Uh, depending on the composition of the wall, um, that, uh, you know, the radar unit's going to see a reflection off of that wall quite, quite efficiently. So uh, now uh, Mike comes along and he holds up a, a piece of cardboard in between me and the, uh, and the wall. Depending on the composition of that cardboard, the radar unit may or may not even see the cardboard between here and there, depending on the dielectric constant or the DK of the cardboard. But I think everybody in the room would recognize that if we took that piece of cardboard and covered it with silver foil, uh, the radar unit's going to reflect off of that and see that all day long. Okay and it's going to be a very large echo reflection. Um, by uh, way of description, air uh, is defined as a dielectric constant of 1.0, so it's not really reflective at all. If it was, the radar unit wouldn't see the, uh, wouldn't see the wall over there. Uh, water, for example, has a dielectric constant of about 70, depending on what type of water, if it's deionized water or just regular uh, uh, tap water or sewage, um, you know, it's going to vary from that. But it's a relatively high number, uh, 60, 70, you know, a little north of 70 sometimes. Um, and so it's very, very reflective. And then other materials, you know, can range anywhere from 1 to 100. And uh, typically speaking, your oils, uh, your crude oil uh, is going to be down in sometimes the 4, 5, or 6 range. Um, I was working with some uh, chemicals at a uh, uh, chemical plant recently. They were in the 25, 30 degree or 30 range on dielectric constants, so you know, still very reflective. Uh, low dielectric constant materials just don't have a lot of uh, you know reflectivity to them, and uh, this particular horn design works really, really well, all the way down to about 1.6. So um, that's something that is just slightly more reflective than air, which isn't reflective at all. And uh, I recently did a, with this particular unit, did a toluene tank. And toluene is very, very low in DK, like in the 2 to 3 range. And this uh, radar unit worked very efficiently in picking up a signal off of that. So the uh, DK of the material is, is very, very important for the performance of the system. So jumping off of that, a comparison really between the three antenna types that we have here, you can see that the, the horn antennas, as your horn size gets bigger, 2, 3, 4, 6 inch, you can see that your beam angle 15, 10, 8 degrees. Uh, uh, so uh, again, as your horn gets larger, your beam angle gets smaller, and you can see that you have pretty good, uh, you have pretty good dielectric constant performance there as well. Uh, the PVDF antenna, um, it has a relatively wide beam angle, but uh, you know, inside of 20 degrees, uh, that 10 to 1 rule that we were talking about earlier works very, very well. Uh, with the flanged encapsulated antennas, you're going to see that the beam angle is going to be, uh, okay, basically 10 degrees. Uh, if you're an engineering geek, you know, 9.6 degrees, that four-tenths of a degree really isn't going to be measurable in the field, 
but uh, you know it was important for some engineer somewhere to uh, to point out that it's less than 10. So anyway, uh, but that 3, 4, and 6 inch flange uh, has very good DK performance and also a very uh, small beam angle. All right. Another flavor of the same ice cream is going to be our HEA, or Hygienic Encapsulated Antenna. Uh, this is very, very similar uh, to the, uh, uh, the flange encapsulated that we just talked about, but this is really designed for uh, food grade uh, applications. And there's a number, you know, you can see here uh, uh, six different uh, antenna types here, or basically uh, process connections and they are different antenna types among each. The most, uh, the most common one in the United States is this ISO uh, 2852 tri-clamp, probably followed next by the, uh, the milk coupling. Uh, a lot of dairies, that's kind of their standard. And that's really, uh, you know, that's going to be your 80% or 85% are really going to be those type of couplings. Here's our tri-clamp assembly here. Um, occasionally, uh, in Europe, there is the Tuchenhagen uh, flange, and the only reason I bring it up is because it's just fun to say. So everybody say it with me this morning, get your good German on, the Tuchenhagen. Uh, I have actually run across one of those that uh, came to the United States on a piece of OEM equipment, and they had no idea what the flange is. We were able to identify it, and it's a, it's a common off-the-shelf uh, uh, flange. So again, here is uh, just kind of a highlight on that tri-clamp assembly. That's uh, you know most of them out there, two, and then three and four inch. One uh, thing of note: the three and the four inch, the actual aperture size of the antenna is just under three inches, and it is uh, basically the same aperture whether it's a three or four inch. It has the same beam angle, um, but just depending on your uh, your tank process connection. Uh, you know, you'll need to obviously size that properly. But this uh, this tri-clamp assembly, um, you know, these things are selling like hotcakes because that is obviously where the, uh, you know, most of the applications come in. Recognize if you've got something else, uh, you know, we've got a solution there. So, um, you know, where is the HEA going to be used? Uh, certainly food and beverage, uh, very uh, resistant to corrosive uh, liquids. Uh, a lot of your fruit juices are extremely... Uh, corrosive, uh, and so uh, you know again mostly liquid applications for this, but uh, some solids are possible uh, in the uh, pharmaceutical industry. Yeah, uh, you know they're all about clean, uh, clean room and wash down as well. And so you know that's uh, you know kind of a small small part of the uh, uh, of the world, but. Uh, you know the pharma and life sciences. There's uh, certainly a, a lot of applications there that are uh, the measurement is done manually and are yet untapped for doing uh, uh, for doing a, uh, a electronic measurement, if you will. Okay, so um, that leads us to the the high frequency radar and also something uh, which is our radar our LR560. Now, this is a 78 gigahertz, so highest frequency uh, radar out there. And one of the things that in antenna design, as your frequency goes up, your horn or your antenna size gets smaller. Okay, Again, that seems backwards to me. I think higher frequency should have a bigger antenna. No, it's the other way around. But um, this particular radar unit does have an emitter uh, right up here at the base of the electronics, and there is a horn assembly, it's right here, but it's all encased inside the unit itself, and you can see that there's actually a Teflon lens uh, here, uh, which basically protects the, uh, 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 protects the emitter and uh, the horn assembly from contamination. Now, if you look really carefully on the picture, and hopefully you've got a, a good uh, connection here, if you see these little dots around the edge of the, uh, uh, the horn there, or the Teflon lens, what that is, is that is an air purge. And if you notice, there's a air connection right here on the side of the uh, radar antenna. And so you can actually hook a uh, air source. I recommend using instrument air, especially if you are in a, uh, a silo, like a flour silo or a lime silo. You don't want to introduce any liquid or any moisture into the air in there because that will just, uh, you know, create a, uh, 
a real nice caking effect on the uh, on the lens itself, and you have to, have to take it out and then manually clean it. Uh, I have seen uh, these plumbed in with a uh, uh, just regular uh, instrument air or the plant air or nitrogen or something like that uh, as a permanent. Uh, this is a standard uh, uh, a, a standard threaded connection, and I have seen uh, in the field where they've actually put on like a uh, quick disconnect. Uh, similar to what I use on my air tools in my garage, and then once a once a day, once a week, whatever the maintenance calls for, a guy comes along with a portable air tank, hooks up a hose on there with a ball valve assembly, gives it a shot of air to blow it clean, uh, you know, three to five second uh, shot, and blows the lens clean, and uh, you know that's part of their maintenance procedure. So I've seen it done, uh, you know, manually and also automatic. Um, one of the things uh, in this instrument, it is a two-wire loop-powered, uh, typically a heart device. There are some other communication options, but heart is probably the most common. And if you are connected up via heart to a PLC system, such as a Siemens PLC or many of the other manufacturers, uh, Rockwell Automation Control Logics, uh, just yesterday we were doing a GE application, what you can do is you can read, first of all, the value of the level digitally and drop it right into the data table of the PLC. It's a lot more efficient way to do it, and it eliminates some of the errors uh, in just converting a digital value to an analog, transmitting it, converting it back to a, a digital value, and then rescaling it in the PLC. You can take that digital word and drop it right into the data table of the PLC. But what you can do if you're doing that via heart is you can bring a secondary variable over and drop it into the data table of the PLC, such as signal strength. And I've seen this done a number of times, uh, I think it's pretty slick, where they monitor the signal strength of the instrument, and if the signal strength drops below, I don't know, pick a number, 50 dB, then what they do is they operate a digital output, operate a little solenoid, give it a shot of instrument error, um, and then check the uh, signal strength. Do that three times, and if, it, if the signal strength doesn't improve, then it sends an alarm to an operator to let the operator know, um, uh, let the operator know that uh, you know additional maintenance is required. I've seen that done a number of applications, but really where this uh, instrument comes into its its best is in uh, dry bulk solids, uh, dusty environments. The uh, LR560 was originally designed for the grain industry. Uh, very tall, very narrow uh, silos uh, with a lot of dust in them. Uh, but I have found that this thing works really, really well in environments such as uh, coal, uh, coal silos, which are very, very dusty, uh, lime and cement silos. Uh, works well with some flowers. Uh, flower is kind of an interesting application by itself. Uh, we could probably spend 20 minutes talking about just uh, flower in general because there's some uh, unique rules there. But um, but this thing will work well in those dusty environments. The worst of the worst that I have ever seen, and I, I always thought coal was, it can't get dirtier than coal. Well, the worst one I found was powdered sugar. Uh, I was at a large sugar plant in the uh, San Francisco Bay Area, and they had several bins with powdered sugar, and oh my goodness, I have never seen anything so dusty in my life. And uh, when I went home after a uh, long day in a, a greater than 100 degree day, I literally went home or went back to the hotel and took my shirt off and stood my uh, shirt in the corner because it was so well starched from the uh, all of the uh, the sugar in the yeah, uh, in the air, all the dust in the air that I picked up. So dusty environments, that's really where this thing comes into its own and there is nothing else like it. It is, uh, uh, you know, it is uh, certainly a, a flagship for, for Siemens and well proven in, in thousands of applications. So, all right. So, one of the things with high frequency, it also does have a very, very narrow beam angle. One of the things that, uh, uh, that I do, uh, I kind of, again, a little thought experiment. If you're standing over the staircase of your house and you're dropping beach balls onto the stairs, uh, some of the beach balls might bounce back to you, but a lot of them are going to hit the stairs and reflect off in some other direction, and that's what we call skip. That would be equivalent to using like a 6 gigahertz radar uh, signal. 
in a solids application. If you're looking at this edge of the, uh, the solids in the vessel and you blow it up real big and you magnify it real large, you'll see that the particles actually create almost like a stair step uh, type application. Um, and so when you're using lower frequency radars, 24, 25, 26 gigahertz in that range, that would be equivalent to dropping maybe tennis balls or, or baseballs uh, onto your stairs. More of the energy is going to reflect back, but some of it's still going to go off in other directions. When you get to 78 gigahertz, that's like dropping BBs onto your staircase at home. Most of the energy is going to hit the stair and bounce right back to you. And that's why the high frequency works really well in solids applications because this, although it looks like a solid surface, is actually a kind of a series of stair, uh, stair steps that build up at the angle of repose of the material itself. The high frequency uh, has a really, really small packet size. And so as that, a lot more of the energy comes back. And it also is a very, very narrow beam angle. That is a true four degree beam angle. And I have, um, I have used this in some ridiculously narrow applications that even I was looking at going, there's no way, there's too many obstructions, there's no way we can, we can point it down there. Well, yes, we can. And it's, uh, you know, it's right up there with the performance that you might get from a, uh, uh, from a laser, which is very, very linear. Uh, this, uh, this will work very, very well in those, in those uh, narrow applications. As you saw earlier, there's a version of this that reaches out uh, north of 300 feet. So uh, really tall tanks and silos, uh, here's, your, uh, here's your application. All right, uh, the last couple antenna types that we have are actually the rod type antennas. Now rod antennas um, are really, really good in one respect because if you have high condensation, these are really resistant to condensation environments. Uh, you know, any moisture that you get builds up on this and uh, it's going to drip down to the end of the rod and, uh, you know, it works really well in those high condensation environments. The main drawback with a rod antenna is it has a relatively wide beam angle. It can be in the 26, 28, even up to 34 degree beam angle. And so if you have a narrow, uh, uh, a narrow tank or a narrow uh, lift station or wet well that you're trying to use this in, uh, it can be a bit of a a challenge sometimes. Uh, there is a shielded section which helps you with uh, installation in nozzles so you don't get reflections from the side lobes and the really wide beam angle off of a narrow nozzle. But um, generally speaking, uh, this is something that you're going to use, like pictured over here, your big uh, two million gallon water tanks. Uh, just yesterday we were at a, uh, uh, a uh, water storage facility or basically a uh, uh, large water tank uh, for municipal water, and they were using a rod antenna uh, in that application very efficiently. It was about a 25-foot tall tank, and uh, you know that's a, a great uh, example uh, for where to use uh, uh, where to use these uh, rod type antennas. Um, generally speaking, on this thing, uh, there's a couple flavors. There is a probe LR, which is a very simple. Uh, not a lot of parameters to it, uh, not a lot of bells and whistles, but if you're just looking for a real simple, quick and dirty uh, radar unit, uh, the L, uh, Probe LR or the LR200, which has a few more bells and whistles, few more parameters uh, for tuning that on, uh, you know, for some, uh, uh, some specific applications, that's really where you're going to, uh, that's really where that's going to perform well. Now, in 6 gigahertz, there is one other unique application, and it's going to be this guy right here which is a sliding waveguide antenna. And this is a product which is optimized specifically for anaerobic digesters, uh, so in an enclosed digester. Uh, in an anaerobic digester, you cannot vent that to atmosphere ever, okay? And so uh, the way that this antenna works is you have your electronics. Here's one sitting on the ground, and I had, uh, uh, I, I had the uh, local guy stand there so you can kind of get a perspective of the size of this based on his foot. You know, this might be six, eight, six or eight feet long. And the electronics are right up here above the flange, but this waveguide, which comes down to a regular horn antenna, um, uh, passes through the uh, flange. It is a sealed connection, but it is movable. So this is going to bolt right onto the top of a large uh, ball valve. I believe this was an 8-inch ball valve that we were uh, uh, doing in this application. And so what happens is you, you bolt this to the, uh, 
uh, to your ball valve, uh, seal it, open the ball valve, and then you can basically push the, uh, the horn, which is going to sit right in this area right here. You can then push that down into the anaerobic digester, get it down into the process. Uh, anaerobic digesters are very foamy, sticky, dirty, nasty, uh, and in, in many cases, uh, very hazardous gases. Uh, but we uh, basically have this sliding waveguide, which is the, the last of our seven antenna types this morning, um, which is optimized specifically for that application. So if you're doing water treatment and you got an anaerobic digester, you know, have, have we got the radar for you. So anyway, so really kind of the key takeaway on this thing, I've got six of the seven uh, types of antennas uh, pictured here. I don't have the sliding waveguide. Really the key takeaway is, um, you know, which is the right solution? Yes. Um, depending on, on what you're doing, you, you know, it may lead to one antenna type or another or certainly one frequency uh, over another. And, you know, if it seems a bit overwhelming, recognize that, uh, you know, you have uh, uh, Lessman as a very, very good resource. Uh, they have some very well-trained, very knowledgeable people that can uh, help you in picking the right one. And certainly you're welcome to reach out to me anytime with any questions that you have uh, with, you know, what type of antenna would you recommend or suggest in, in this application or another. Um, so you have, a lot of, uh, uh, you have a lot of resources at your disposal. Um, the, uh, uh, the radar units themselves typically can be programmed either locally using a handheld or the push buttons on the unit itself. Uh, you can program and configure them using a whole suite of software packages. Uh, you know, we recommend Somatic PDM. Uh, PDM software is something that I spend a lot of time out in the field training on, on how to use that for going out and documenting your system. So the radar unit's out installed, it's working perfectly. Uh, six months later, it's, it's not working. And uh, now you have something to go back and reference. I just had this happen where we did an installation uh, uh, kind of late in the year, it was working perfectly, and so we had saved the parameters as left when it's working. Um, I got a phone call saying, hey, the radar unit's not working anymore, went out to the site, and the first thing we did was went and connected to the radar unit, did an upload of the memory, and uh, looked at the parameters, and you know looked at the parameters as left when it was working, and as found on the day that we were there, and uh, sure enough, somebody had changed the empty distance on it. And, um, you know, the site has no idea how that happened, but somebody had gone in and, and changed the empty distance and uh, caused the unit not to perform very well. And so we had a, uh, you know, using uh, the software, we were able to document uh, the system and, uh, uh, you know, basically look for, uh, you know, problems or changes later on. So um, we've got, you know, in uh, radar, Siemens has over a million field installations out there. And so, you know, there's, it's certainly uh, proven in the different technologies. So that really kind of leads us to how do I choose? You know, with all these different choices available, how do you decide what's best for my application? So just kind of wrapping it up here, I uh, basically have broke this down into six key questions that, uh, you know, I always ask in any application. And question number one, uh, normally I would ask the, the room, you know, what do you think the most important question is? Question number one is, what is the material that you're measuring? Is it a solid? Is it a liquid? Is it a slurry? Is it something that just behaves as a solid? Um, you know, that really is question no, uh, most important. That's going to lead you down a particular path. Number two, what's the dielectric constant of the material? Beware of low decay materials because they can, they can jump up and bite you. Having the wrong antenna or the wrong frequency for a, a, a low dielectric constant material uh, is, is just a recipe for disaster. Probably not going to perform very well if you're not tuned into that. Question number three, what are the temperature and pressure ranges? Okay, that might lead you to a particular solution certainly with the antenna itself. Question number four, what about uh, your environment? Are you general purpose, intrinsically safe, explosion proof? Um, you know what? Uh, uh, you know what kind of protection do we have to have for the electronics? Most of our radar units are uh, uh, intrinsically safe, uh, and uh, certainly, uh, you know, class one and div one environments are, are certainly possible with some of them. But uh, usually not too hard. But I don't know where it's going. 
Um, is it an open air or a closed vessel application? Here's something that's significant. FCC uh, Part 15 still has limitations for using radar applications in open air, so outside of a building, uh, looking at a level of a pond or a river or an open tank or even a non-metallic tank that's outside, there are limitations. Uh, the FCC regulations did, uh, uh, they did amend uh, Part 15, and their amendment was something about half the size of a New York phone book. Uh, and uh, it is not a, you can use uh, radar measurement outside unrestricted uh, without, you know, uh, without limitation. Uh, certainly there are certain radar units and antenna combinations that uh, meet the FCC regulations, and there are some that do not. And uh, certainly Lesman or myself can help you with uh, choosing that if you've got an open air. And really kind of the last thing on here is what is the material that the vessel is made of? Okay, beware of non-metallic uh, tanks such as uh, fiberglass tanks or poly tanks. Uh, you can see objects that are outside of the tank as the radar will pass right through the side of a, uh, uh, of a uh, fiberglass tank. I had an application recently where we were having poor performance it was staying locked on a high level. Uh, I went up to inspect the radar. By the way, it was a tank farm. There was like 24 tanks, and 23 of them were performing well, and the 24th tank was not. And so we went up to look at that tank, and I'm standing there looking at it, and all of a sudden two neurons in my brain connected, and I realized I'm standing on a steel catwalk, which is right alongside the tank. And sure enough, the radar unit was seen through the side of the fiberglass tank, catching a reflection off of the steel uh, catwalk that it was standing on and interpreting that as a level. Uh, sometimes ladders, uh, you know, somebody may come along with a ladder and stand a ladder up alongside of a non-metallic tank temporarily and you can affect the performance of the radar as it'll see through the side of a poly tank. Uh, so look for those type of things. Uh, if you have a steel, stainless steel, concrete tank, not an issue. It, uh, the electromagnetic energy will stay constrained within the, uh, the tank itself. So with that, um, that's kind of nearing the end of our time. I'm going to, you know, open it up to the token question slide here. And uh, I'm going to jump off of that real quick because uh, all I include here is my contact information. Uh, feel free to email me or uh, uh, call me via phone anytime. Um, if it's 2 o'clock in the morning, call Lesman first, then call me. No. Um, I do have uh, uh, my cell phone does sleep on my nightstand. And I realize stuff happens in a figure. If I'm up fixing it, you should be up too. And, you know, that happens sometimes. Please use some restraint, but, you know, I'm always here to help you 24-7. And uh, if you do call me in the middle of the night, you might have to give me a minute to figure out what hotel I'm in, what time zone I'm in, and who you are and why are you calling me. But, uh, you know, we'll get there in the end. But, uh, you know, feel free to reach out to me or the Lesman team anytime uh, with, uh, uh, you know, with questions on this. Uh, we covered a lot of information in a in a relatively short period of time, and in order to fit it in our time slot, I intentionally glossed over some detail uh, in order to you know give a good overview. Uh, this certainly is not an exhaustive discussion of uh, electromagnetic antennas. Uh, that certainly was one of the areas. Uh, uh, my minor and my uh, degree is actually in communications uh, and antenna design and microwave. Uh, applications. So if you want to go if you want to go bits and bytes and go into the uh, the deep math of antenna wave propagation and Maxwell's wave equations, have a ball. Let's have that discussion offline and not bore everybody else on the phone. So with that, um, I'll basically turn it over. Uh, Mike, did we have any questions that came in this morning? We, you know, in, interestingly enough, you must have done a great job because I don't have any questions as of yet. So we'll Go start ahead, our wrap up, and if a question if a question comes up, uh, we'll go ahead and get it answered. But yeah, at this point, and, you know, uh, I Mark just put everybody to sleep. That's why there weren't any questions too. That happens. I don't think so. Know. It was it, well done. Well, thank uh, you. Mar yeah, thank you very much for your presentation, Mark. Again, if, if anybody does have any specific application questions, please feel free to give us a call, 800-9-LESSMAN. Uh, uh, if you don't know your account manager, feel free to ask for me, and I'll make sure that uh, we get you taken care of. 
if you do want to know more about the technologies we supply, please follow us on social media. Uh, Dan Wisey, one of our technical specialists, has a blog. Uh, if you subscribe to his blog, he puts out uh, some tips uh, pretty much weekly. Uh, he's very active with it, and uh, some of the things that he puts out there are really great tips. All of our webinars are posted on both our website and on our Lessman Instrument Company YouTube channel. If you want to know when something new is posted, uh, you can follow us on LinkedIn or Twitter, and we'll, we'll post them both there as well. Next month, our webinar topic will be presented by Lessman's own Bob Kakanda. Bob's going to teach you how to create an ISA 100 wireless infrastructure for your instrumentation. If you've thought about putting wireless instrumentation in your plant and aren't sure whether wireless heart or ISA 100 is the way to go, you'll want to tune in. If you'd like to figure out how to cover your entire plant with a wireless connectivity for your instruments, you won't want to miss Bob's session. It'll be held 9 o'clock a.m., just as this one was, on April 21st, and announcements will be coming soon. Uh, Mark, I don't have any further questions. So at this point, uh, we'll conclude the presentation. Uh, thank okay. you, everyone, for attending. And, and Mark, thanks for putting on a great presentation. Not a problem. Thanks for uh, attending and taking the time out of your days. And, uh, you know, recognize uh, in my job, I'm here to help you. That's what I get paid to do. So, uh, you know, from a technical standpoint, feel free to reach out to me anytime. So thanks for the time.